thank you so much for joining us for this special hangout. We've got some amazing guests with us, and everybody has one thing in common, their love and passion for sports and fitness. Um, we have an amazing panel. We have Sam Cass from the White House Let's Move campaign, also Peter Moore with Men's Health. We also have Olympians, uh, Rachel Flatt, who is a figure skater, and bobsledder Kurt Tomasevich. Also joining us is two-time CrossFit Games champion Rich Froning and our very own local Houston Texan, Jared Crick. Thank you all so much. Joining me here in the studio is astronaut Mike Hopkins and lead strength and conditioning coach Mark Williams. So thanks again, everyone. Um, this is going to be a great discussion. I know we have a lot to cover. I kind of wanted to start with you, Mike, since this is uh, a little bit triggered by your upcoming mission, first time yeah. spaceflight flyer. But why don't you just start by talking about um, how you grew up being so active outdoors okay. growing up in Missouri. Yeah, that sounds great. So uh, first of all, I just want to say uh, thanks to, to all the folks, the panel, for, uh, for coming out here today. Um, I'm really excited to, to speak and to hear your stories and to uh, share your, or uh, hear about your experiences as well. Um, so actually, all of you are, are very motivational to me. And so I'm, uh, like I said, I'm very excited about this. Um, so just jumping right in, you know, sports has always been uh, sports and athletics and, and staying fit has always been a big part of, of my life from, from growing up, whether it was playing on the farm or once I got into uh, middle school and high school of, of playing on sports teams. And then that, I was very uh, fortunate to be able to continue that into um, college and, and being able to play football at the University of Illinois. And uh, then from there, I just, it, it kept with me. And so even throughout my career in the Air Force, uh, working out and staying fit and participating on intramural teams was, was always important. And then I got this wonderful opportunity to come to NASA and, and be an astronaut. And, and lo and behold, physical fitness is a huge part of, of, of our training and, and what we do as well. And so, um, um, so I'm just very excited to be able to share that, that love and that passion of fitness and, and how it applies to being an astronaut in life and space and, and, and hopefully um, get other people motivated uh, about fitness as well and, and maybe a little motivated about space. So this is great. Just earlier today, we kicked off um, the Train Like an Astronaut program, which is actually part of the White House Let's Move campaign. Mm -hmm. So Sam, maybe you want to talk a little more about that initiative, which also strives to encourage kids to be active? Absolutely. Uh, you know, everybody wants to train like an astronaut, right? Uh, no better way to train. So uh, thanks for having me. We're so excited to be here today. Um, you know, our physical fitness is one of the greatest indicators of our health, and the lack of physical activity in our daily lives is, you know, uh, has been a real, uh, taking a real toll on the health and well-being of our, of our children. And so the first lady is really calling everybody coming together, uniting around our kids' health and well-being to ensure they're getting the healthy food that they need and the activity that they need to, to, to thrive and hopefully one day become an astronaut. Uh, and we're seeing great progress. We've launched a lot of programs in, in schools, Let's Move Back to Schools program to really make sure our schools are facilitating kids being active. Um, but we know we got to get our kids moving. I'm a lifelong athlete, and uh, so I've seen it in my life, and we see it in, in kids across the country about what not just athletics, but also just being active can do, uh, not only for their physical health, but also their mental. And we know that our kids perform better on math tests and reading comprehensions if they're getting the activity that they need. So I'm, I'm so excited to be here. I can't wait to hear questions and ask some questions. I will say I have to admit that I have a savings account that one day hopefully will get me to outer space. It's my greatest <laughs> dream in life. And so I don't know, maybe if you got an extra seat, I could uh, hop on board for your next mission. I'll work out. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Uh, but yeah, it's great to be here. Maybe we should have added that as an incentive yeah, for the Train Like an Astronaut yeah. program. Yeah. Well, the so free ride. The Soyuz is pretty tight. Uh, we, there's not a lot of extra room in it, even for the three of us that, that are planned to go up. So I'm not sure if we can uh, find room for you on this one, but maybe uh, in the future when we yeah. have some commercial vehicles going up, there'll be an opportunity. All right, all right. I'll, I'll work out. I'll, I'll train like an astronaut until then. That sounds great. Um, so you touched on a couple points. I know, Peter, you also, I think, are very athletic, and childhood obesity has been kind of a special issue for you, too. You kind of focused on that earlier in your career. Maybe you could jump in and talk a little bit about that as well. Hey, I want to address something first, though. Sam Katz told us that his dream was always to be in Men's Health magazine uh, <laughs> rather than about how he wanted to go into space. <laughs> so I don't know uh, what the heck is with that, Sam. I'm a little offended. <laughs> But he did a great job. We also had this guy in the magazine. Not uh, bad. 
uh, oh, talking yeah. about health care, which was pretty awesome. But yeah, I've done a lot of work on childhood obesity uh, in men's health, in part because uh, about half of the guys who subscribe to men's health are dads. And you know, we really are uh, in kind of an unprecedented moment in uh, the health of our kids right now, because so many of the adult diseases that we think of as you know the things that will catch us when we're uh, 75 and 80 are actually affecting you know kids in their early teens. Um, you know, they used to call um, uh, type 2 diabetes adult onset diabetes uh, because you had to be an adult basically to reach the point in your life where you could develop the, uh, the symptoms. Uh, they don't do that anymore. The adult onset uh, thing has, uh, has gone away. Now, we're, now we call it type 2 diabetes because so many kids are suffering from it. Um, you know, I don't want to be a big downer here. In fact, the, the rates of obesity have leveled off now. It shows we're doing some good work as a culture, but you know, clearly there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And, you know, the First Lady's uh, Let's Move uh, program is a great part of that. But I guess, that you know, the last thing I would say is that really, uh, you know, weight is a family issue. It's not a matter of pointing fingers at kids and saying, you know, it looks like you're putting on a few, you've got to take care of that. Really, what's going to happen is that if, if moms and dads and kids and families work on this stuff together, both the food aspect and the exercise aspect, that's where the real progress is going to be made. And really, who among us, you know, parents or kids, uh, can't afford to, uh, you know, do a little bit better, do a little bit more, eat a little better, and you know that's why I really applaud what the first lady is doing, and and uh, and probably Sam's doing most of the work on that, right, Sam? Uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm I'm pulling my weight, but yeah. I can't, I couldn't agree with uh, more with what you said, and this is something that we have to address in the context of the entire family, um, and ensure that the family is getting the supports that they need to to make the best choices. So. Uh, the stakes are high for our country, but um, I'm optimistic that we're on the right we're on the right track. Hey Sam, I don't know if this is an out of bounds question, but I'll go ahead and ask it. Do you get a sense that the that the first family, as busy as they are, and you know, jetting around the world and all the stuff that they have? I mean, do those Obama girls have time to to work out too? Are they are they following Dad's example? Oh, absolutely. I, one thing in this family is that you know they they practice what they preach, uh, both from what we eat to you know making sure we're getting plenty of activity. Uh, you know, the first lady, we eat balanced, my plate style meals, uh, and uh, but it's all about moderation so that after you know if you have a, a you know a cheeseburger once in a while or some pizza it's no big deal but day in and day out we're having fruits and vegetables and whole grains lean protein etc and yes they they those girls get plenty of exercise uh, doing all kinds of different activities and sports and so no there's no question uh, you, they're walking the walk yeah I'm wondering now Sasha's the older girl right uh, uh, Malia is the older girl. Okay, so last time I saw a picture of Malia, she looked like she's about as tall as her dad. Does she have a lefty layup like he does? <laughs> uh, you know, I can't. I, I, I'm not going to compare the layups. I'm, you know, there's nothing good in that for me. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, they're they're a talented family all the way around. Cool. Okay, well, we're well all watching. We managed to not have an NBA player on here, but I think we've got the whole the full suite of other athletes. So I want to definitely uh, bring them in. And um, speaking of diets, I was kind of reviewing Rich your background, and I think you were pretty open about um, you're really lucky you don't really stick to a, a strict re diet regimen. You have the privilege of being able to eat what you want. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, the training you're in right now and how you keep healthy and fit? Yeah, so you know we talk a lot about in CrossFit either the Paleo diet, which is a more um, naturalistic type diet or the zone diet where you, you balance your insulin spikes but uh, with the amount of training volume and stuff that I'm doing especially right now calories are calories and uh, you know at the end of the day I'm probably putting in uh, right about six or seven hours of training and then uh, leading up to the game starts next week actually so uh, we show up on Monday and uh, we don't really know what the first event or really when the first event is so you just kinda gotta got to hope you got a little enough energy from the food that you you've taken in so um, but you know for health reasons and when I'm uh, done competing uh, you know there's the what we call the paleo diet or you know a more minimalist diet where you're eating whole foods versus processed stuff um, for health reasons is definitely beneficial gotcha. so rich I think a lot of us out here are jealous of uh, 
of your uh, ability to eat whatever you want. That uh, man, I wish I could do that. I haven't been able to do that since I was playing football. But I certainly recognize that uh, all that time you're putting out in the gym and all that is a is a big reason for that. So, uh, and, you know, I do want to say as well, good luck next week. I know it's a big week for you, and uh, I hope all the best for you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and a lot of people get caught up in. Well, Rich eats whatever he wants, but there's a lot of work that goes into it. It's not just, you know, and as much as I say I eat as much as I want to, throughout the day um, I'm usually taking in protein shakes and stuff like that versus actual meals, and then at night, you know, to catch up on calories, really. And it's still, I try to eat as healthy as possible. You know, I, I take in good fats for energy and stuff like that. I'm not just eating ice cream and all that type of stuff. So <laughs> there's still, I'm still eating relatively healthy, but... Um, I'm not sticking to you know your your caveman diet as they call it. So right, right. yeah, hey, hey, you guys, all you can see is Rich's head there, but this is what he looks like <laughs> in that self magazine. Yeah. Wow, that beard too. check that out, huh? Yeah, yeah. He must be uh, eating the right stuff. That's amazing. He's doing something right. <laughs> Well, uh, speaking of um, being in active training, I know Rachel and Kurt, likewise, and, and even Jared, you're getting ready for the upcoming football season. Maybe you guys can jump in and talk about your training and how much diet plays into that. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll jump on down that a little bit. Um, I also played college football in Nebraska, actually, just like Jared did. And uh, Mike, I know you said he played in Illinois, too. Um, yeah, I'm feeling a little I outnumbered. Football, <laughs> uh, I started bobsledding, and this is my 10th year of bobsledding. So I've really been an athlete for quite a while, and I've seen how my diet has had to change in order to, to maintain uh, my top level of athleticism. You know, like when I was in college, you know, I'm not sure how old you are, Rich, I guess, but you know, I could eat anything I wanted, and uh, you know, I could stay pretty active that way. Um, but at the age of about 24, 26, uh, my appetite got a little bit smaller. I couldn't eat as much. You know, and it took me a little bit longer to recover from workouts and that sort of thing. So, and I think as males, at least, um, as we age as athletes and uh, try to stay fit, I think our diet uh, okay. changes quite and a bit. And Kurt, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm, I'm hearing from our technical folks the audio is a little bad. If you could just speak a little louder, but we, we still want to hear from you. Okay. Uh, I can try it again. I don't know if this is any better. <laughs> that sounds better already. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank uh, you. Um, no, I was saying that uh, I played college football as well at Nebraska, just like Jared did. And, um, you know, when I was in college, I could eat anything I wanted as well. And, uh, Rich, I'm not sure how old you are, I guess, but, uh, you know, about age 23, 24, I really learned that my, my appetite changed quite a bit. Uh, my diet had to, had to be altered in order to, to maintain a top level of fitness. Uh, it probably changed again when I got to about age 28, 29, and I'm now 32. So I think it's a, it's a key point to, to mention that, you know, as you age, you know, you try to stay fit. You know, your diet will change. You know, sometimes you... Can, you know, down six, seven thousand calories a day and be able to stay fit, but when you get a little bit older, your body doesn't react the same type of way. So, and I think probably a lot of it also is just the nature of the food you're eating. Like Rich yeah. was saying, whole foods, better, you know, better quality food versus some of the lesser. Rachel, you want to chime in? We'd love to hear from you as well. Well, I'm currently a student at Stanford University, so uh, yeah. and Mike, I'm sure you're quite familiar with it, <laughs> um, but. Uh, you know, I, I really do try and keep an active lifestyle, especially when I'm training uh, and <laughs> spending some very late nights doing homework. Um, but, you know, I do my best to keep a normal eating and training regimen as I'm training for competitions, um, especially with the rigors of my academic career. So, uh, you know, making that, um, that or I guess working on that balance uh, every day can be quite challenging at times, but you know, you do your best to make sure that you're giving your body what it needs at the end of the day so you can recover and train for the, you know, for the upcoming competitions. And what are you studying at Stanford? I'm curious. And Kurt, I think you have a degree in astronomy, right? Or maybe that's Jared. I'm Somebody else has no, that. I, uh, I have a minor in astrophysics. My degree is in electrical engineering, so okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's, it's pretty rare. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> and I'm doing a, I'm majoring in biology, um, planning to be a medical student and going to uh, pediatric orthopedics. Oh, um, that's great. Sorry, Mike, not going to be an astronaut, even though I'd love to. <laughs> Mike, that's my cousin's goal, though. <laughs> Maybe not yet. We have doctors yeah. and biologists and that's right, a yeah. few engineers. So. And, and to be honest, I've always dreamed of being an Olympian. So uh, <laughs> I'm very jealous of what mm -hmm. you two are doing and your accomplishments as well. 
Okay, well, I would love to turn it over to um, Jared, who's um, also here in Houston and part of our local NFL team with the Houston Texans. So, Jared, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, the one thing I'll add about nutrition, um, it's a little different for me being a defensive lineman. i got to keep weight on uh, opposed to, uh, to losing it. And down here in the Houston heat, uh, the biggest thing for me is, uh, you know, staying hydrated. Um, you know, I drink upwards to about 12, uh, maybe 13, 14 ounces or glasses of water a day uh, just to keep up. And uh, for me, eating, um, you know, I got to eat a lot to, uh, to keep my energy up with this heat. It'll drain you. And, uh, you know, going into fall camp right now, um, the biggest thing is going to be keeping my energy up, keeping the nutrients in and uh, replenishing after every practice. Like I said before, the heat, it's something else down here. So uh, nutrition definitely plays a, a crucial role in uh, what I do. Yeah. So I think it's also really important in space flight, if I remember correctly, a lot of people experience a little bit of weight loss, don't eat as much. I don't know about drinking in space, but... Is that something they've talked to you about to get ready for the mission? Like, how do, how do they prepare yeah. you for that? And I'm, I'm sure Mark can, can talk a little bit on this as well. But uh, anecdotally, I've, I've certainly heard that sometimes your, uh, your appetite does change. You, uh, you maybe don't eat quite as much as, as uh, you're used to or you normally do. Um, some of that can have, you know, particularly in those first few, uh, that first few weeks when you're adapting to life in space, you may not just feel great as well. And so that might curb your appetite a little bit. Um, and But the fortunate thing is we've got uh, a food lab here, a nutritionist, that are, are very concerned about our diet. And so we're very lucky because uh, they, they put together our menu. I don't have to uh, really think a lot about what I'm going to eat. Uh, there's, there's something there for me that, uh, that I'm sure I'll like as well. And I don't know, Mark, if you have anything to add on how much uh, weight guys lose when they first get up there? Or... Uh, we, we usually see about an 8 to 10 pound loss. Uh, sometimes and then usually by the end of the mission they've gained that back um, and like Mike said it usually changes at the beginning they kind of lose appetite but as it moves on they're eating most of the time more calories than they are down here because you are actually they act they are more active up there they're up more t more hours during the day doing more work so they stay pretty active yeah. so. actually Jerry I'm just kind of curious if I ask a question here for, yes. for Jared. Um, you know, how much uh, weight are you typically losing in a, in a two-a-day practice in, in August in Houston? Oh, uh, well, uh, my, the most I've lost is uh, about 10 pounds in one day, and that was, you know, after drinking during the practice and, uh, you know, staying in, as hydrated as I could, but uh, most about 10 pounds, but usually it's on average about five, and that's for everybody. Um, you know, it's just the amount of water that you lose during a practice. It's hard to keep up, and uh, you really can't replace what you lose during the practice. So it's crucial, you know, after the practice to get in your, you know, your supplements and as well as rehydrate. Yeah, Rich, do you find the same thing during the the competitions with uh, with CrossFit that you you really have to try and keep your uh, your intake up while you're competing? To be honest. Uh, Training here in Tennessee is a little bit different than training in California when I actually compete at the games. Uh, the humidity is miserable in Tennessee, so when you go to California, it's hot, but it's not anything near the, the same heat as it is back home. So my hardest part is, is training leading up to the games, is trying to stay hydrated, trying to get out of the heat every once in a while when I can because it's, I mean, it's just muggy, and I sweat like crazy anyway. It's, you know, I, I can lose uh, three to four pounds in a workout, and my workouts aren't two to three hours like his are, so yeah. it uh, it all depends. Yeah. Right. Hey, Mike, I have a question for you. Um, are you familiar with uh, an astronaut named Sunita Williams? Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely. I don't know if, if all the uh, people who are watching know that uh, she famously ran a Boston Marathon on a treadmill, finish it in four hours and 20 minutes. Well, I think she was or orbiting the Earth. I, I wonder, uh, Mike, if you have any plans to, to show Sunit up and maybe do a triple Iron Man or something up there. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think you can uh, show Sunny up. She's, uh, she's a pretty incredible person, a pretty incredible uh, runner in her own right. Um, you know, I was actually hoping that uh, I, I'd have an opportunity to maybe compete in the, in the CrossFit Games from on orbit. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the timing's uh, not going to work out real well. I don't get up there till September, and uh, as Rich said, they're they're competing next week in that. So um, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I may just try and do some of that. Uh, the the open workouts where uh, they they put out an exercise and or a, a routine, a workout of the day, and and you film that. So we'll see. 
Yeah, you know, it, it, the follow-up question that I had, you know, I've been reading about what kind of workouts you guys do up there once you're in orbit, and I'm seeing that, you know, it's actually built into your, you know, your work duties for the day, and then you can be exercising two to four hours while you're up there to fight that muscle loss that inevitably happens. You know, I guess what I'm really wondering is how you fight boredom as, a, as an exerciser when you're doing it, you know, two hours a day. I, mean, I do it because I, I tend to play a lot of sports, so you're interested in the game, and that keeps you motivated. I wonder how you uh, make it through a two-hour workout. Yeah, so, um, you know, the nice thing about working out on orbit is you actually are in orbit, so you're floating around, and so I think that, that in itself probably uh, relieves a little bit of the boredom. And then the other amazing thing is the, the ARAD, which is our adaptive resistive exercise device, so that's our squat rack. Um, it, it definitely looks a little bit different, but it accomplishes a lot of the same uh, exercises for us. But uh, when you're on that, you're actually right over the cupola. And so you've got the, the earth floating by underneath you as, uh, as you're doing a squat or a deadlift. So uh, probably the hardest part is going to be not hurting myself mm -hmm. by uh, getting distracted as, uh, as the earth's going by. Yeah. Well, you be careful, all right? And I'll do that. <laughs> I, I actually have a question, if you don't mind. No. Uh, for Rachel, I'm curious. Uh, I haven't followed be honest figure skating very much, but I'm curious how much strength training do figure skaters actually do? Well, most skaters tend to avoid doing a lot of major strength training just to uh, ensure that they don't bulk up. Because in skating, you you know you really want to keep a lean, fit body. So a lot of us will do like yoga and Pilates. Um, I actually, I work out here over the OTC, but you do a lot of body mass exercises, so you use your own body mass to uh, work on, you know, uh, training your muscles and uh, doing all those sorts of things, and especially with regards to cardiovascular training, we do our best to do, uh, you know, to do a lot of anaerobic training earlier in your season, um, a lot of anaerobic training um, uh, prior to that in our preseason, so um, it's, you know, it's quite a bit of work, but it is, you know, a little bit different from what some of the athletes might do, like from what Kirk does in the weight room every day. He does an incredible strength training for bobsled, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess ours is uh, quite a bit different from Rachel. We're all doing a lot of resistant training, squats, cleans, um, resistant sprints, you know, anything to get stronger and faster and bulk up and, and put on mass without uh, hurting our aerodynamics of our sled. So. Uh, most of my work is resistance work, and so it's really interesting to hear about the, uh, the adaptive resistance uh, mechanism that you guys use up in space. But um, I also want to ask uh, Mike and Mark, um, you know, Rachel and I are training here in Colorado Springs. We're about at 6,000 feet, and, uh, you know, my sport is all about power, uh, short burst of power, and so uh, my endurance is very low. You know, if you asked me to run 200-meter dash, I'd probably pass out, but I can run 50 meters pretty good. Uh, but, you know, so the... You know, training at altitude, you know, affects athletes in different ways. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, when you're up in space and you're training and that sort of thing, I, I understand that, you know, it, it's pressurized up there and everything. But, you know, about what altitude, you know, can you compare being inside the space station yeah. or wherever you are with, uh, you know, what altitude on Earth would that be? With oxygen yeah. That sort of thing? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an excellent question. And, uh um, the, the altitude that we're at is basically where we're sitting right now. So uh, it's, it's sea level. We're at about 14.7 uh, PSI. So uh, that's uh, kind of the standard. Now, I, I like your idea, though. I hadn't thought about that, of maybe changing the pressure in, this, in the station so that we can uh, <laughs> train like we're up at 6,000 feet. I don't know if I can get the engineers to go with that, but that's, uh, that's a neat idea. Maybe want to be careful with that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a little bit. <laughs> Hey, I actually uh, have a question for uh, for Kerr. I'm just um, one of the things I've noticed from my time playing football at, at Illinois, which was back in the late '80s, early '90s, and I know you're about a decade after me, but I've seen a huge change in uh, in the way we worked out back then to to what we're doing now, and I think what I see Rich doing, et cetera, where there's uh, um, a little bit, you know, when I was when I was training at Illinois, a lot of weights. Um, and uh, and then running was kind of a separate activity as well. We didn't combine those as much as what I, I feel like I see now in, in this CrossFit. So I'm just curious for you, Kurt, have you noticed that change from when you were playing at Nebraska and, and, uh, and how that's um, evolved, I guess, over the last 20 years? 
Um, possibly. You know, you say I, I came a decade after you, and I think Jared's close to a, a decade after me, so he might be able to, to add more to this after I'm done here. But, um, yeah, when I was in college, you know, uh, there was a great strength and conditioning program in Nebraska under Boyd Epley, and, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot. Um, and mostly, you know, I would say probably over half of our conditioning was done in the weight room and with the running workouts as compared to just with football practice. Um, there was a great balance of winter conditioning and summer conditioning in between fall football and spring football. Um, so year round, you know, there was a, a lot of workouts. Um, they were continually doing uh, research, you know, trying to find better ways and, you know, different ways to, to, you know, adapt to different athletes because, you know, each athlete, each position, you know, required different types of workouts. So, um, you know, it was a lot like bobsled training that I do now where it's, you know, building up strength and power um, for, you know, big bursts of, of energy. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it has changed quite a bit. Hey, as long yeah. as we're doing the uh, Kurt and Rachel show here, it, uh, I had a, a, <laughs> a, a, a question for the two of you. Like, you both have very different, you know, sports. Uh, Rachel's obviously in a, a finesse sport. Kurt's in a power sport. But I think that one of the things that you guys would both have to deal with is fear, in that both of your mm -hmm. sports in their own way are, are pretty dangerous, actually. I mean, do you guys pay attention to mental training in addition to your physical training as you know as you as you look at these enormously difficult uh, tasks that you have to carry out absolutely you know uh, mental training is hugely important to what we do especially when we get on the Olympic stage you know we've trained so hard at that point um, and it's all muscle memory but it really comes down to the mental game and if you can prepare yourself to the point where you can perform under any amount of pressure in any situation and really be flexible with that. So for me, uh, you know, if that involves a lot of visualization and, um, and doing a lot of uh, simulations and practice uh, before I do a competition to ensure that I really feel prepared uh, prior to a competition. Um, I guess conversely to, to what Rachel does, I think our mental training is to train ourselves and not to think. Um, you know, if you think about what you're doing, you're going 80, 90 miles per hour, you know, on the edge of out of control, you know, that's when you can let the, the mental side of things creep in and cause negative thoughts, and you don't want that at all. So the less you can think about what you're going to do, <laughs> maybe the better. Um, but, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, that's what makes our sport exciting, is that there is that fear. And, uh, you know, if you can overcome that fear, that adrenaline rush every time, you know, that's, that's what makes it fun in a way. Okay, in that case, Kurt, I withdraw the question. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, while we're, we're talking about the mental parts, I, I'm just curious uh, for like Jared, for example, have you had any uh, major injuries in your in your career? And uh, you know, you talk about that mental piece. I uh, just a couple years ago blew out my first uh, ACL. And that's the first major knee injury that I had, and uh, I have to say that one of the hardest parts was mentally coming back from that and and being confident. Um, in my in my knees, in my joints, uh, to to continue working out. Uh, I don't know, Jared, if you had any of those experiences. Actually, I have. Uh, I had my senior year of college cut short. I uh, I had tore my pec muscle, and that sat me out for the entire year. Um, and like you said about the mental part, um, you know, just just uh, wondering if you're going to come back 100. percent That was the biggest thing for me. Uh, it seemed like recovery took forever. I wasn't going fast enough. I wasn't sure if my strength was going to be back or it was, and uh, you know, it took a while for me to trust in my uh, my arm again, and it took probably uh, somewhere mid you know season last year until I finally felt okay. It's it's not going to tear again. It's you know it's back to where it was. I can go full bore again. Yeah, well, wait till your uh, wait till your forty, Jared. That <laughs> <recovery>. <laughs> um, for Team NASA, I'm curious to know, like in the training, you know, to go you know to outer space. Is there anything different in that you specifically trained for that would be different than, say, any of the other uh, sort of just basic differences in how folks are training for their different sports? But are there particular things about being in outer space that either, you know, that you're doing preparing, you know, on planet Earth, or once you get out there that you have to be extra aware of that, like, when I'm in the gym, I would never even think of? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the, the first cut at that, and, and then I'll turn it over to Mark, because I know he's going to be able to get a little bit more specific on it. But uh, one of the things that we do here on Earth and we have to spend time training on is the actual equipment that we have on orbit and understand how to use it, um, And because there are limitations to it. And it's, it's very critical 
to our space flight um, and to our own health. And so we want to make sure we're using it in the right ways and when we don't break it and all of those kind of things. Because if, if those pieces of equipment go down, that's a bad day on station. And that takes, uh, maybe the toilet would take priority if it broke. But uh, when, the, when the ARAG goes down, you're jumping on that to make sure that uh, you get it fixed. So a lot of the training that we do on the ground is going to mirror the types of exercises that we're able to do up on orbit. And, and Mark, I don't know if you want to add to that a little bit. Yeah, the only thing I would, I would add is that one of the things that we deal with in space flight that we don't normally deal with in a 1G or we don't think about it much is bone loss. Bone loss in space is accelerated. We see about 1% a month. So what we try wow. to do with the resistive exercise device is mitigate as much of that as we can. And we do that by manipulating the volume, the, the, the weight that the astronaut's actually lifting, the changing of exercises. Every day it's something different. And we're trying to basically, as for simple as to try to trick the body into thinking that it doesn't know what stimulus is coming and it never has a time to adapt to any one particular thing. So that's one of the things that, that is a little bit different in flight. Other than that, we, the loss of strength in aerobic, we do the same things. So we're going to train aerobically to gain cardiovascular fitness, and we're going to train strength to gain muscle strength and muscle endurance and power. So, no, it's pretty much the same. <laughs> you just described CrossFit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we, it, it's actually we, interesting you say that, Rich, because a lot of um, uh, a lot of what we are doing now involves workout of the days and involves uh, exercises that uh, um, I guess are are doing more than again, like when I was was playing football. You know, you just lifted weights. Now you're doing um, this whole host of exercises in a row in 20 minutes, doing as many as you can, and uh, that's certainly been something new for me, and it gets your heart rate going. But can you help me understand how that works without gravity? How what works? You know, how like I assume that like the fact that there's no gravity would have an impact on, you know, what kind of exercises are in play. Like what is what would CrossFit look like if you're floating? Well, it's not well in flight it's gonna be different. I we haven't decided what we're gonna do with that yet, <laughs> but we're still go we're still gonna to focus on the main activities that are the main exercises, which for us are squats. In, in many different forms, deadlifting in many different forms, pressing, shoulder press, push press, that kind of stuff. All these things, we can still do those in flight with the resistive exercise device. It's going to be how we put those together with running on the treadmill at the same time and, 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 and moving over and doing something else. That's where it's going to get a little tricky. We haven't kind of figured that out yet. We have a little bit of time to work on that, Yeah, but we'll see. That sounds yeah. tricky. <laughs> yeah, Sam, because actually one of the things that happens there's a little more overhead associated with getting on the treadmill, for example. So it's not like I can, can sit there and, and do um, some deadlifts and then just float over to the treadmill and start running. I actually have to put on a harness. I have to strap myself into the treadmill. And, and so that right. in itself is going to take away from some of the benefits of the things that Rich is doing where you know he's, he's doing 20 pull-ups and then immediately jumping down and doing burpees and then running or, you know, all these kind of things. And, and it's a little harder for us to do that in uh, the zero gravity environment. Yeah. I think this is all a lesson to the rest of us who don't have to strap on an apparatus to get our weightlifting in. <clears throat> we can just do the work. You know, here on Earth, we none of us has that much of an excuse for not doing it. Uh, we just have to uh, make, make sure we organize our days to take care of it. Mm -hmm. Well, but, uh, you know, it's interesting you say that because we, we certainly don't have an excuse in orbit either because they put it on our schedule. And, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> part of the paycheck, right? That's yeah, part of the paycheck. Of yeah, actually, that's one of the great things about it. And, in fact, uh, most of us here on this, uh, on this panel, right, I mean, can you ask for anything better where you actually get paid to, uh, to work out? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. All right, now, I wanted to... Sorry. No, no. Um, I was just going to jump in because we did solicit some questions by Twitter, so I was going to just throw in a couple of those real okay. quick. Oh, okay. Um, so one is from at Willow1988 uh, who asked, is it, about, is it all about balance or is it to do with packing on muscle before spaceflight as muscle mass is affected in space? Uh, yeah, so I certainly wouldn't say it's packing on muscle. Um, I'm not trying to do that. It's, it's a balanced approach. It's uh, much like... Uh, uh, the cross more of the CrossFit style of, of workouts. I, I would say what we do is we look at from a training perspective. We look at each individual astronaut and we take away strengths and weaknesses, and we're going to focus on weaknesses a little bit more in their training. 
and the strengths we're not going to emphasize as much. So we try to get a much more balanced approach through strength, endurance, power, anaerobic, aerobic fitness, agility, coordination. Any you throw out anything dealing with athletics, we're gonna we're gonna try to make it as balanced as we possibly can. And, and another probably an important part is what's going to happen, what that crew member is going to need to do during mission. Because for instance, if it's a um, a crew member who's going to be doing spacewalks, there might be different workouts, I know, especially for the females, right, to, to make sure they've got the upper body strength yeah. to do certain tasks. So that's something yeah. else that's looked at mm -hmm. pre-flight. Yeah. Yes. Um, and would you say um, on-orbit and especially post-flight is even more critical as far as the, the training that you're doing with the crew members? Well, the post-flight, I would say, the, the in-flight just to mitigate it, and it's, that is important. And, and, and the more we can mitigate, the easier the post flight right. is going to be. You know, they're going to recover much more quickly. So, okay. you know. Gotcha. And and Rich, I definitely didn't want to inter interrupt you, so please go ahead with your question. <laughs> no problem. I w it's about the the apparatus that you guys use. Is it more like a band tension, or no. what's the how does I don't know how does it really work? Yeah, I don't know if I can actually answer how it really works. You should see <laughs> the thing. It's uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, the, the folks that put this thing together, um, it it actually. You know, we, we have a, a bar that that's, looks like you cut the uh, the two oh, ends no. off of a weight bar where you where you put the weights, and so from where your hands are going and everything, it, it looks very similar uh, to what you're using on a on a daily basis. Uh, but the difference comes in is how we get that load, and uh, we actually have these two chambers that uh, we have a vacuum in, and so we're pulling against that vacuum, and we're cool. able to dial in how much weight we want. Um, I don't think we can probably get up to the kind of weight you're lifting. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, the other thing, it goes up to 600 pounds, so we can get up to 600 pounds on it. That's awesome. Now, now the thing you got to realize though is that when you get to space, you you take away your body weight. Right. So we have to add. So like for squats, we add back in 75% of his body weight into whatever he's squatting in 1G. Gotcha. Now you're putting, now you're pinpointing that one load just on that back. So now there's some back issues. So you kind of got to balance that a little yeah, bit. Yeah. There's a balance. You know, yeah. The other thing that's very interesting about A Red is that within that vacuum canister, we also have, we have these little flywheels that kind of rotate and spin, and we u we add those in to create like an inertia. So you almost get a gravity f effect. So you you know how the you can feel the weight changing yeah. direction. It's not just a constant this constant well, oscillation. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, I actually have a, a question that I could throw out there to to everybody. Um, you know, I know, uh, Sam, and your involvement with the Let's Move, and, and we're here talking a little bit about the Train Like an Astronaut program. Um, are there any other kind of activities uh, that, that the rest of you are doing the, to, you know, to try and help motivate kids or working with kids or even adults or, or anything like that that, uh, that I'm not aware of and, and you'd like to share with us? I guess I can answer first. Um, I won't uh, take credit for doing it in an official capacity or anything, but uh, I do try to get to many high schools and many elementary schools and talk about uh, health and fitness and that sort of thing. And it, it drives me crazy when kids think that uh, playing Wii is physical activity. You know, it, I just want to get these kids outside, you know, play outside, do some kind of game, um, eat breakfast in the morning before they go to school, you know, try to give them some kind of uh, incentive for, for doing the right thing. You know, one of the things that we've been uh, really talking up a lot is uh, making note of how <clears throat> uh, school physical education programs have really been mm -hmm. under attack, especially in tough budgetary times for our governments. Listen, I get that. You know, school districts have to balance their budgets just like everyone else does. But it, really, the, the, the more we learn about it, the more we see that there's very much a connection between uh, physical activity and mental performance in the classroom. So that's one of the causes that we champion very strongly at Men's Health, which is you know, defending physical education in our schools and letting uh, parents know that that's as important a part of their education as mathematics is. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I know for me, just personally, if I don't get my workout in in the morning, man, mentally the rest of the day, is, it's just not right. Mm -hmm. So Mike, I have a question for you. Um, this is a huge part of what we do as lead athletes, and I'm sure Jared and Rich are quite familiar with this. But um, we, you know, we do a huge amount of training volume throughout the day, and so when we're done training, we obviously have to help our body recover. Excuse me. So, you know, we do a lot of uh, contrast baths with, uh, you know, a hot tub and a cold plunge, where you 
uh, subject yourself to the wonderful task of, uh, of you know, a 105 degree hot tub in, mm -hmm. for two minutes, and then you're into a you know freezing cold tub of you know 45, 50 degrees, um, which is not wonderful, but you know it helps the circulation and helps uh, get some of the lactic acid out of your body. Um, you know, doing things like that to getting massages. So, is there anything you all do in space after you know after a daily workout to help your body recover? Um, well, I'll have to uh, I'll have to talk to my crewmates about the massage piece, but I, I'm not sure we're going to be able to, to to work that one in. Um, so, you know, I, obviously, I haven't I haven't been up there yet, so I'm not quite sure. I, I'm sure Mark can add in here, but I have heard that the recovery time actually up there is is quicker. It's uh, it doesn't take as long when you have that real hard squat workout and your your legs are just aching the next day. Um, as far as I understand, is oftentimes that's not the case on orbit. So, and Mark, I don't yeah. know if you want to add on that. Well, yeah, in orbit, I mean, you think of 22 hours out of the day, you're floating around with no weight or no load on your body, so the recovery is, is much quicker. I mean, we do we do squatting and deadlifting every single day, seven days a week for six months, and we haven't had any overtraining injuries or any muscle tears or anything like that. So the recovery actually comes pretty quickly. Awesome. All right, I really, really hate to have to wrap this up because I think no. it's been an awesome discussion, but <laughs> we are out of time. And I want to thank all the panelists. I think this was really neat to hear from all these different perspectives, and we should try to have this hang out again. Um, so we encourage everybody to follow everyone who's training or preparing, um, and Mike, for your mission. So uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining, and uh, we look forward to following your mission in space. Thanks. Right. Thank thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you.